My wife and I grew up in small Christian Missionary Alliance churches. And we were taught from day one, you can serve God or you can go get a job and write a check to those who serve God. Right? How many of you have ever had that experience? So what did we do? We graduated Bible college. My wife, magna cum laude. We took off and we went to Indian reservations in remote parts of British Columbia and, and Saskatchewan because we're outdoors oriented. This identity piece, I think, is just so critical to who we are. I don't think God gives us formulas to himself. That's what we want. If I do A and I do B, I get C. But that negates relationship. And I believe what we're called into is a relationship with God. So our journey through that, whew, it's been a wild ride. A year in to our, our terms and, and staying on an Indian reservation, given my, my history at that time, I was a vertical rescue technician, I worked search and rescue, I was an EMT, wilderness EMT, all those kinds of things. I had a passion for seeing people experience God in the outdoors and keeping them safe while doing it. And a young child was lost on the res. Middle of July, freak snowstorm comes in, and this seven-year-old girl's gone. So I jump in, I organize a search crew, and it took us an hour. We found her hiding behind a log, and we rescued her. Holy Spirit moment, it was wonderful, ask me about it later. Next thing I get is the, the chief of the reservation calls me over. He says, hey, I, I heard you know how to fix computers. And so, yeah, what, what's the problem? And so I go over and I fix his computer. No big deal. Has this over for dinner and he says, here's what I'd like to offer. That house next to mine, we'd like you guys to move into that. I also want you to start a business on the res fixing computers. I want you to train our people. We're going to give you that space rent free. And you're going to fix computers, teaching our people to do it. Wow. That, okay. And since the white guys literally won't come across the river for a search and rescue situation, we'd like you to train us and bring in whoever you need. We'll fully fund it for you to start a search and rescue team on the res. I'm thinking, I never have to raise support again. Yes. Right? What's the most... Won't go there. Um, so... What do I do? I call my supervisor, say, hey, guess what? This is what we were just offered. And he says, Jeff, I'm just so proud of you guys for integrating. We got to use those Christianese words, right? Integrating in, into that community. Let me, get you, let me get back to you. Hour and a half later, I get a call. Listen, still proud of you, but if you take a penny from the res, you no longer work for us. No, you may not do those things. I'm 23 years old, grew up missionary church, went to Bible school. I was taught that God put leadership in over me and that I was supposed to submit to leadership. But it didn't feel right because I felt like everything inside of me was God was opening doors into this community, but I submitted. And so it wasn't long before we were no longer with that organization because it wasn't a fit. It wasn't who God made us to be. And there was this constant grind that was going on. So they did actually help us to find another organization where we had to continue to raise support. This time I was a whitewater rafting director for a youth ministry up in Washington. There were months that less than $200 came in. And when I would call people to say, why didn't our support come in? They say, I'm working hard at my job and I'm paying for you to go whitewater rafting with a bunch of kids? I've got a conflict here. And I'm going, this is broken. And so I beat on the table, and I said, we have a sustainable opportunity here. We are the best trained rafting group in the tri-state area, Oregon, Washington, Idaho. We have the best guides. We have the best track records. Everybody in the industry knows it. Why aren't we charging? Why is it that we feel we have to go so low in the number so that anybody can come? So we left that one. I said, you know, this, this fundraising thing doesn't work for me. Let's go try doing a church plant. We end up in Bend, Oregon. And about six months after we landed in Bend, backed by a denomination, 
uh, to start a church, we were, we were told, 9, it was right after 9-11, bad timing, right? There's no more funds here for your church. We know you've just moved your family, but we're done. So in the meantime, I was fly guiding because that is my passion, um, and it is more spiritual than any other angling in the world. Um, and I'm wrestling. I'm wrestling with this. I'm in the workplace piece, and God just told me, this is how I took it, I'm not good enough for him. And so I'm wrestling. I'm crying. I'm on the river. A client is coming out to meet me, and I'm literally bawling my eyes out as he's pulling into the parking lot up above. And so I clean myself up, you know, try to splash a little water. I go up and meet him with smiles, and we go down to the river. And I always take him to the middle of the river so that uh, I can see how they cast, right, without snagging in the trees and the grass behind us and everything else. And uh, so we're chit-chatting, and, and as a guide, you stand just front to the left, especially if they're right-handed, so that you don't catch that fly in the back of your head as they're casting. And he asks me the question, what brought you to bend? I've got a choice. I'm going to answer, I came here to plant a church, or I'm going to answer, I came here to teach people to fly fish. If I answer in the first one, the rest of the day is likely to be really awkward but it was just under the surface in me. And I said, I came here to plant a church. And sure enough, crickets. Crickets. All right, what am I going to do now, Lord? I finally, I look over my shoulder because now he's quit casting. And the guy has completely broken down. He fell to his knees in the middle of the river. And he said, I need Jesus. My wife doesn't want to be with me. I took this trip today so that I didn't look like an idiot at home on our vacation sitting by myself. My kids didn't want to be with me. I need a change. I spent the rest of the day escorting him into the kingdom. Fly fishing. God told me in that moment, I made you for that. Quit trying to fit in everybody else's box. So, Fast forward, we went ahead and started some companies, started some software companies, built and sold them with the goal that I would get the big hit, I'd never have to raise support again, and we'd go back to ministry, still stuck in the boxes. I didn't want to raise support ever again. This was the way to do it. Until I came home one day, and my kids said, hey, Dad, can we go grocery shopping? Mom hasn't gotten off the couch in three days. And so <clears throat> I quickly looked at my wife, realized that I needed to rush her to the hospital, called the neighbor, come pick up our girls. They were 12 and, and, uh, 12 and 14 at the time. We go to the hospital, the hospital sends us home, says, hey, there's no hope. It's a terrible word to have to hear, no hope. And get your affairs in order because she won't be here by Sunday. So we did try having that conversation with your kids. God hit our reset button so hard that in six months, I almost lost my wife. Had to explain that to my kids. We lost our house that we were so proud of buying on the west side of Bend. We lost the ski boat in the garage, and we were down to $200 in our bank account. Looking at each other saying, now what? Do we still believe God has a plan? From that was birthed, keeping it as short as I can, because there's a lot in there to unpack. Um, was birthed this idea that God could use our passion, our family, right? That we could do this together. So we now know that life is short. We want to do everything we do from here forward together. What is that? What are the things we're passionate about? I'm tired of putting on a coat that just doesn't fit. As a software CEO, I felt like a fraud every day of my life because I knew that God still had a calling in my heart. As a missionary, I felt like a fraud. Matter of fact, I was told several times, Jeff, you're too business for missions. And then I get into business and everybody says, Jeff, you're too missional for business. I don't fit. I don't fit. Until one day I think about opening a fly shop with the idea of outreaching to a local community. I go to buy the flies and the guy that's going to sell me the flies says, oh, hey, you don't buy them from me here. We fly you out to another country and uh, you show up there, and we take care of you for a couple of weeks. You pick out your flies, and by the way, what do you like, little boys or little girls, because we'll take care of you. Proposition me right there in America to fly to another country and take advantage of some child that works for them. I was devastated. As a dad of three daughters, you can imagine how that ripped my heart out. 
On the way home, I said, honey, we're backing out of the fly shop idea. We're going to start the first ethically traded fly company. I don't know how we're going to do it, but we're going to find people that have been exploited, and we're going to pay them double a living wage. I don't know how we're going to make the numbers work or what we're going to do. So we did it. Long story short, we ended up in a place where we work with women that have mostly, not all, been trafficked. Most of them are coming out of safe homes, domestic violence, most of them straight out of the red light district. We're dealing with issues like PTSD, HIV, uh, motherhood, life. And in this particular location, many of the gals that end up in the brothels were sold there by their dads at the age of five. It's a lot to unpack. But we created jobs. Through those jobs, we are able to give our testimony in a closed country. We're able to share the gospel openly inside of our workplace. Through that, when those gals showed up to our first training, I didn't have any clue. I mean, you guys ask me the stories later. Um, no clue what we're walking into doing first aid before we could start classes. But at the end of two weeks, these women went from downcast and shameful to heads lifted taking selfies because they walked back into the red light district and they said, we found this guy who will treat us as equals, loves us like daughters, makes training easy, and pays us five times the value of a man. Isn't that the identity God gives us? He inverts that for us. He changes the entire dynamic. And without doing this through trade and just giving aid, we all know the problems there. But in trade, they don't walk into a store with food stamps or money somebody else gave them. They walk in with a paycheck, and they get to choose what it is that they're going to do. So our journey has been huh, anything less than a formula. It's about God teaching us, just be who I made you to be. And if that's a business person, it's okay, because I made that in you. I gave you your passions. I equipped you the way that I equipped you, and I gave you the experiences that I did so that you would go out and do this thing. So my encouragement to all of you, find your identity in God. He'll give you the passion. Likely you already have it. I started like third grade as an angler. And he'll use that for the kingdom. And you are clergy. You don't have to wait for somebody else to tell you that. You are a member of the kingdom, and you have a role to play. So thank you for that today. Thank you.